In the Oval Office today with South Korea's President Moon Jae-in, President Trump said he hadn't thought much about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. I know nothing about WikiLeaks. It's not my thing. And uh, I know there is something having to do with uh, Julian Assange. I know nothing really about him. It's not my it's not my deal in life. During the 2016 campaign, the president had plenty to say about WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks! I love WikiLeaks. Some brutal stuff. I mean, I'd read it to you, but the hell with it. Just trust me. WikiLeaks unveils horrible, horrible things about Hillary Clinton. WikiLeaks is amazing. It shows she's a real liar. As soon as I'm finished, I'm going to read it. Boy, that WikiLeaks has done a job on her, hasn't it? It's unclear why Ecuador suddenly decided to evict Julian Assange. But two key events in the timeline, the finding of no collusion by the Mueller investigation and last July's trip by the vice president to meet the new president of Ecuador, where the two leaders discussed Assange's alleged crimes. The United States has always cherished our relationship with Ecuador, and we are determined to renew that relationship for the mutual benefit of both our nations. The president said he trusts Attorney General William Barr to handle the Assange case appropriately. That will be a determination, I would imagine, mostly by the attorney general, who's doing an excellent job. So. He'll be making a uh, determination. President Trump also weighed in again on Attorney General Barr's declaration yesterday that the Trump campaign had been spied on. I think what he said was uh, absolutely true. Uh, there was absolutely spying into my campaign. Uh, I'll go a step further. In my opinion, it was illegal spying, unprecedented spying, and something that should never be allowed to happen in our country again. And I think his answer was actually a very accurate one. This is dirty politics, and this is actually treason. And on North Korea, the president said sanctions will stay on, but he is open to some humanitarian assistance for North Korea. He also indicated that while he still wants full denuclearization, he may be willing to consider South Korea's suggestion of smaller deals to keep up diplomatic momentum. There are various smaller deals that may be could happen, things could happen. You can work out step by step pieces, but uh, at this moment, we're talking about the big deal. The big deal is we have to get rid of the nuclear weapons. President Trump continues to hold out an olive branch to North Korean leader Kim Jong un again today, talking about the economic potential of a North Korea without nuclear weapons and being very specific to say a North Korea with Kim Jong un as its leader. Brett? John Roberts live on the North Lawn. John, thanks. Uh, what do you think about the Electoral College? And I said in 2000, I think it should be abolished. I think it should not be, the, you know, the way that, that we pick our presidents because we evolved to one person, one vote, and we got to get paying attention to make sure that that's still our, our rule in our country, but one person, one vote. Um, so. You know what, 19 years ago, I was saying, yeah, I, I don't think we should continue it. I had no idea 19 years later, I would feel even more strongly, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that we are seeing this movement, and some of you, I'm sure, have followed it, where people in state legislatures and Democratic governors are passing a provision so that a state will instruct, by law, its electors to vote for the candidate who got the most votes in the country. And that, and that is moving forward, and they're trying to get enough states that would represent 270 electoral votes to do it, um, because we have to do something. I mean, part of, the, part of the many structural problems that we're facing in our political system, in our democracy right now, is that people feel disempowered. Well, you right. certainly feel disempowered if, number one, you try to register to vote and you're turned away. Number two, you actually register to vote and your vote is purged. Right. Number three, you show up to vote thinking you are registered and you're turned away. Or you vote and the person you vote for gets the most votes, but that's not the person who wins. So I think that this is, you know, throw it into the future. Don't look back to 2016. Don't look to 2000. Throw it into the future. We have to re-empower American citizens to feel that their vote matters, that they're going to go to the trouble of voting, we're going to stand against any obstacles and voter suppression, and that the person with the most votes wins. So I think that that's all part of what needs to go forward. If
first of all, re remember why the framers did this. First of all, communications in the late 18th century weren't quite what they are today. <laughs> nor, was, nor was travel. So they sent these electors who actually had to go tell people who the people were for. And in some states, they didn't even have a popular vote. Secondly, there was a real worry then with a little country of only 13 states that you had all these small states that would be just totally swamped by the big ones and stomped all over in ways people couldn't even imagine. Now, you know, all these federal programs, for example, Medicare, Medicaid, many of the development programs, they're designed to take account of income differences and other things, but they basically are at least fair to these people. But the Electoral College was part and parcel of guaranteeing every state to senators so that the states, with the small states would be also overrepresented in the Senate. Those of us who believe the Electoral College should be changed, as Hillary pointed out, don't propose to change the Senate. So it's not like the small states would, you know, be shafted. But what happened, the reason this has happened twice, and particularly 2000 was really funny, but by, uh, by 2016, there was a very substantial edge for the Democrats and for people who wanted communitarian politics in the country, but they were increasingly concentrated in more urbanized areas. And there was more and more alienation in rural America from the culture, from the economy, and from the sense of political disempowerment. And I know I grew up in uh, you know, small town in Arkansas. And I know about this. I mean, I, I, I just went home to the Chamber of Commerce in Hope, Arkansas, where I was born, and did a panel with two guys I went to kindergarten with. <laughs> it was a hoot. And one of them was my first chief of staff. The other worked for me in our case for the Supreme Court when I was attorney general. But we all were little kids in kindergarten together in a town of 6,000 that, you know, is part of that movement. But you have to understand that, that they do. We need to pay attention to them. But they sh if we don't do something about this, within 20 to 30 years, 70% of the American people will be living in fewer than 20 states. Which means that if, if you start running a campaign to a majority of the American people, you are spotting the other side 40 or more electoral votes before you ever get off the ground. It'll be, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Uh, and I just think we got to do something about it. But, you know, the, the whole ground on which the Electoral College was constituted, it no longer makes any sense. There are no communication problems. There are no travel problems. There's no information problems. There's no nothing. And we, we need to do this. And the small states do have a claim not to be run over, but that claim will be protected in the United States Senate, not by having some sort of lock on the White House. That's a step and a half times a thousand too far, I think.